All right, so the first part of the lecture is a bit of a refresher. Uh, we started uh, working with uh, applicatives and monads, not a lot yet in the lecture, but we will get there. Uh, so the first part is a bit of a refresher. Um, the second part is about debugging Haskell. So how we go about understanding and debugging if something doesn't work uh, in Haskell. And then the third part is about the reverse Polish notation, which will be useful for some of the future labs. So we will see how it goes with time and whether I will manage to do all three things today. So let's start with a first quiz. Some of the questions are open-ended and some of the questions are um, quiz-like, timed. So we have some weird symbols, dollar and braces and multiplication and some braces and pure. What that sounds like, where do we use it? Great, so half-half, uh, those are typical for applicative functors. So this is the apply, pure, and fmap. Uh, all three are used and defined in the applicative uh, functor class. Uh, so they are indicative that we're using applicative, right? Next. Oops. Enter. Bind operator and return, where we use those with. So now we should have 100% correct, because those people who answered previously correct will answer here correct, and those people who thought it's related to Monads will know that it is monads now. Perfect. So bind and return are defined in monad class and they are used for monads. Um, applicative functors was the previous slide. So we have the apply and pure uh, and fmap. Here we have bind and return or fish operator. The fish operator is the one which has the this one in the middle, and we have also reverse bind where we swap the arguments. So all of those are about monads. Okay, semigroup. Uh, what is the semigroup with? Um, let me open. I should have. Yep. So let's let me pass it. Now oh, come on. Yep can place it here. So if I go to GCI and uh, we have some, it, it's a little bit tricky sometimes because for example, a list. So I have a list L and it's one, two, three. And I have a list M, which is 10 and 11. Um, lists are, can be used as applicatives. They can be used as um, semi-group and they also can be used as a monad. But um, if, I, if I'm if i using kind of a, this operator apply, that means I'm using them as applicatives. If I'm using bind, that means I'm using it as, uh, with the monadic um, type. So usually you can work out um, what you want uh, so remember M is this, L is this. So semi-group has, um, semi-group has this operator. So this operator takes one semi-group, another semi-group and produces an, an instance of the same type. So you have to be in the same type, right? Um, and this operator for lists, so remember again, L is this, L is this, 
M is this. So if I say L combine it with M, it sort of works like a concatenation. So this operator, you can think of it as kind of a concatenation. Th that is the implementation of this operator for lists. In different contexts, it can be a different thing, but usually what you want is to have um, an operation which combines two elements and produces the same the same thing, right? Remember, like uh, for example, plus uh, plus in the integer uh, domain is a is an operation which makes this a semigroup, right? The same with the multiplication. So integer is to integer together with the, one of those operations will be a semi semigroup, right? And then a monoid would have an identity element. So some semigroups don't have an identity element and they are still a semigroup, um, but some do have. So for semigroups, remember this. And that actually comes handy for one of the labs because uh, your goal is to combine all the errors and then you will have some sort of a error state, <laughs> error kind of a representation from one operation and from the other. And maybe this is exactly what you want, right? So uh, for semi-groups and monoids, you just have this uh, combination, combinator uh, operation. Um, okay, so monads, bind and return, applicatives, fmap, apply, and pure. All right, so let's do some code reading and code reviews to harden our kind of uh, understanding of those. So which one is a correct line of code? Oh, crap, that's complicated. We're using maybe type with a function and a bind operator. So, okay, we are in the monadic context. So what is correct and what is not correct? What can we do? How we use bind? All right, so many people thought this one is correct, but it's not. Uh, let me show you. So I will quit that. So I'm on top of the page again. Okay, so if we ask, um, if we ask GHCI, tell us about bind it will show you that bind takes two arguments. Bind takes an argument which is a value in a monadic context. So for example, just 10, that's fine. This is a value in the monadic context. Uh, and then the second argument is a function. And the second argument must be a function which takes a normal value, not in a monadic context, and provides us back a return, which is a, a value in a different, uh, in a monadic context, potentially in a different type, right? So for example, if I have, um, if I have just 10, so this is the, the first thing. I have value 10, which is a number or integer in the monadic context of maybe, right? So that, that is fine. And now we need a function which takes a normal value and produces something in the uh, monadic context. So if I say my value is this, okay? And then I need a function f and my function f needs to take a normal argument and produce something in the monadic context. What could that be? Um, what could be a function which takes a normal Argument, uh, normal element and produces something in a monadic context. Um, well, it needs to be something that takes a normal argument, right? So for example, plus 10 
would be such a function. So plus 10, let me just double check what was the, yeah, so in this case we have plus 20. So I will use the same. So plus 20 is a, a function which takes um, a normal argument. But if I ask, okay, tell me what plus 20 is, it says uh, type, show me the type of plus 20. It says it's the function which takes a normal value and produces a normal value of the same type, right? So that's not um, not that's not good enough. So we could, for example, combine it with show. Um, and now it takes a normal value of type B and produces a, a, a different one. So it goes from A to B. Uh, they, they use B here, like it could be nicer if it's A, <laughs> but the, the point is it, it changed the return type. Like the normal plus 20 doesn't, it sort of keeps it within the number space, but this one co converts from one category, which is numbers, into another one, which is strings, right? But it still is not in a context, right? So we do need something which kind of gives us back the, the context. And in this particular, say, context, we need maybe. So we need a function which takes a normal function and produces something in the context of maybe. So how we can turn 10 into maybe 10, how we do that? Well, we have um, a type constructor. Um, so we can say just 10, but you, you also know from applicative that you have pure, and also you know from monad that you have return. So both of those, if you check give me a type of pure, it takes a normal value and gives you a va this value back in the applicative context. And then if you check for return, it takes a normal value and returns you a value in a monadic context, right? So if we were to do this plus 20, um, so let's say we have a function f now, which has a type, it takes a normal value and produces us a value of the same type, in this case, number, in a monadic context, right? So this is why this answer is correct. Um, because we have a normal, um, we have a monadic value and here we have a monadic function. Um, so, one more thing, if we go about the type of bind, bind takes monadic value and monadic function, and then gives us back a monadic value, right? So value in monadic context, a normal function, uh, a function which takes normal value and produces monadic value, and the monadic value is the output of this. So two arguments, first monadic value, then monadic function. So monadic function is first, is second. Here it's first, so it's wrong. So this is why this, this is incorrect. So monadic value, monadic function. Monadic function, first argument to bind, and then monadic value, second, wrong, okay. Here we use return and here we use pure. Um, this is somewhat unorthodox because we combining monadic value, which is just 10, and then we are using to combine it with the monadic function, but we are comp composing this monadic function with pure, which is an applicative, right? But this pure will produce us a, a new maybe instance and maybe is also a monad, so it will still work, but it's a little bit kind of uh, impure. Like it's a little bit um, um, if if you're using maybe as a monad, you probably should communicate it directly by using return. But this will also work because uh, you know if I do pure ten in the maybe in context, it will give me just 10. And just 10 is a monadic value, 
it is an applicative value, but it's also a monadic value, and it will work with um, it will work as the output of this processing, right? Um, so pure, it's, you know, if we double check it with return, they basically give the same answer, right? So both of them are correct. Both of them will compile and both of them will work, but this one should be the preferred one in the context of using bind. And then again, uh, the function needs to be the second argument, not the first. So that's why this one is wrong. Okay, so we kind of decipher it. Does it make it clearer now? Thumbs up, thumbs down, questions. I hope it, it clarifies the situation. All right, so let's try more. What's the result? What's the result of this? First of all, is it correct? So compiler error, compiling warning, okay. And second, what is the result of doing this expression? That should be simple. Perfect. Most people got it right. Um, there is no error. Uh, monadic value, monadic function, uh, return will turn the, the result into maybe number. Uh, we combining 10 with plus 20, so it will be 30. We'll have just 30, so no magic here. Perfect. All right. Another one. So what is the monadic value here? So the term monadic value means there is a value in the monadic context. So monadic value is some sort of value in the monadic context, okay? So just 10 is, because it's a normal value 10 in the monadic context of maybe, so just 10. But also the return of this is just 30, and that is also a monadic value, right? So remember here, um, we have this bind, bind operator. It takes monadic value as a first argument and gives us back a monadic value, right? All right. Another one. What is a monadic function in this? All right, so this one is easy. We, we just talk about it, so it should be straightforward, but there is a catch. Uh, the catch is, and in the exam, uh, you have to, if there is a multi-select question, you have to select all correct answers, right? So here, there are two correct answers and you should select both. I don't know if in, in a menti you can select two, but in the exam you will. So very good. Um, what is the signature of monadic function? The signature of monadic function is it takes a normal value and produces a value in the context, right? And this function does this, but return alone also does that. So the type of return is exactly that. It takes a normal value and produces a value in the monadic context. So that's why both of those are correct answers. Um, th both of those are uh, monadic functions. There's, imagine that we have this dot gone. We just say return plus 20. Would that work? Would that, like if, if we take this dot out and we say, bind this monadic value with a function which is return plus 20, right? So um, if I do this, 
Uh, yeah, I will quit such that we have clear context. So if I do just then, so this one is a monadic value and a maybe monad, and I'm binding it with a function which is return plus 20. Would that work? Uh, I don't have a question for that, so I use chat. If you think it would work, or if you think it wouldn't work. So this works for sure, because that's just 30. But how about this? There is a dot missing. So it's a very minor thing. Um, so there is a... So Jan Olaf thinks it would not work, and he is correct. Um, why that would not work? Okay, so let's do a little bit. Uh, I can present her and you know show you that it doesn't work, but let's do a little bit of investigation. So let's have this function f. Let's check what type this function f has. Do you know what type of this function has? So if, if if I do again, if I do this, uh, and I ask, what is the type of f? The type of f is a normal value going into a value in a monadic context, right? Yes, normal value, which we expect to be a number, going into a normal value, which is also a number in a monadic context. Why this b? Why it has to be a number? Because we have this addition. We are kind of doing addition on the argument, which means the argument needs to be a number. And because we're doing the addition, it means the result will also be a number. And it will be the same number. If it's an integer, it will be an integer. If it's a float, it will be a float, and so on. Um, so now, if I don't, if I take this dot out, what is the type of f? Well, the type of f is not um, b to monadic b anymore. It's monadic value of a function. So I have a function from number to number inside a monadic context, right? So in our case, I have just plus 20, right? That's what I, that's what I got by doing this. So I didn't got a function, right? You see, there is no argument. Like th this thing doesn't take an argument. This thing is a value. And this value has a function inside its context, right? So the function is inside, but this doesn't take any arguments. I, I cannot combine it. Like I cannot say, uh, do it with 10, right? Uh, I cannot use space, which means apply this function to to this argument i cannot do that because this is not uh, accepting any arguments it's not a mapping from something to something it, it, it is just a value right so if i do that I, I have an error if i do this i don't have an error this works fine but this doesn't work fine right um oh, oh this this doesn't work, which means this will not work. If I take this for the same reason, it will not work because now I have a monadic value. Oops, I have a monadic value here on the left hand side, and I have another monadic value on the right hand side. There is no, no function to bind, there is nothing to, to, to wire it together, so it doesn't work. So this little thing is could cause some, some issues uh, in your coding. All right, so we are doing quite well. Very nice, Ronald is reading, leading the... So let's see how we're doing with time. Okay, we're doing fine. So when do we use function pure in your own words, shortly? What do you would say? When would you use the function pure? 
Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, that's not good. That is not good. All right, so let me go again here and um, show you some small task. Okay, so we have you would use it with applicative functions. Yes, exactly. So let's see. Uh, let's say you got uh, you are asking for an input from a user, and you're asking for the input from the user, and the user can give you a number or it cannot give you a number, and then you may have a number or not. So we will be using maybe int. And then let's say we have um, a value. And the value, of course, could be nothing. So the user gave you kind of a wrong thing. Or the value can be just 10. OK? So if you have just 10, um, or let's say it's, a, it's some sort of a payment, right? So it's, um, I don't know, 13, 25. Um, we will use integers for payments. And then you need to calculate. You have to do some calculations. So you need to calculate 50% of that, right? So you have to multiply it by 0 0.5, okay? So now you have this maybe number and you need to multiply it by half. Uh, how can you do this? How can you combine this function with this number? You cannot just try to multiply it directly because the number is in the context, right? So because the number is in the context, you cannot um, combine it directly, right? So you could say, I have to map it, right? So oh, uh, F map it. Um, so you could do this and then you get the number. The same is if you, if you use this operator, which is an F map in the infix notation. So this one is in the kind of uh, postfix notation where the arguments come after, and this one is kind of infix. So it is in between. It has the left hand side and right hand side, but it is F map. It is exactly what F map is, right? So then you have this. But you can also want to use apply operator. And apply operator. Um, so this one will not work. Let's ask for the apply. What is an apply operator? And apply operator takes a function from A to B and a value A and produces B, but the function needs to be in the context, in the applicative context. So that the function, our function multiply is from A to B. Uh, actually, it's from A to A. Uh, but we cannot use it directly. We have to have this function inside the context, right? So look what happens if we use pure. It will work, right? So we, using pure, every time we want to convert a normal function into a function in the context or a normal value into a value in the context. So if I say pure, 10, and I'm doing this in the context of maybe ints, I'm going to get just 10, right? Uh, so instead of using the uh, the type, uh, the value constructor, I'm using the function which takes a normal value and produces me the um, maybe int result, right? So usually you will see it in this context because you want to chain uh, application uh, of applicatives together. And the first function is your normal function, which takes multiple arguments. And then you will kind of need to turn it into, into pure, right? Um, so uh, kind of a, a, a very uh, typical use case is you have a student, and the student takes a name and surname and age. Um, so this is your kind of a record constructor. So to construct the student as 
So you would say S equals student, and then you will have name, oops, surname, you will pass those parameters, right? And H, and H is a number, right? But if you're getting those things from JSON or you're getting those things from somewhere where you need to do validation, then instead of doing this this, this way, um, what you would do is you would say S equals, and then you would say pure student, and then you will combine it with the uh, applicatives. So you'd have the name, you'd have the surname, and then you would have the age, right? And then this is where you use the pure, sorry, to turn the function which takes three arguments, normal arguments, into a function in the context of this applicative. Um, of course, some people don't do pure. Some people say fmap student do this. And then after this, you will after this you will have the value the, the function partial partially applied function in the context and then it will go to surname and age so those two are exactly the same so either you use pure with this for consistency or you would do this right Yeah, exactly. So this is a very good, uh, this is very good answer. And this one is also good. So we're using it to provide a mechanism for putting something in the box. So pure is it puts something in the applicative box. Return is exactly the same, but with the monad. So we have value or we have a function and we are putting it into the, um, monadic box, right? Would it work if I use return um, for this? It would, but again, it, it's like a, we want student to be in the applicative box, but we're putting it into the monadic box. And it just happens that th those two boxes are the same because maybe is an applicative box and monadic box, right? Um, almost all monads are uh, applicatives, but not all. Sometimes uh, we have a monad which is not an applicative, and then you cannot use it with the applicative apply. You have to use it with bind. No, monads, not applicative functions and not unnamed functions. We use return to put something into a monadic box. It, it is exactly the same as pure, but for the boxes which are monads. Um, it has nothing to do with unnamed functions and it has nothing to do with applicatives. All right, oh, two more to go. And then we'll have a break. All right, this one is a little bit more complicated. Will it work? Will it not work? And what is the outcome of this? Most people got it right. Um, the destructor <laughs> uh, got two people here. Um, so what is happening here? Uh, we have two monadic values. We have monadic value here. Um, in, in this case, they are both applicative values and monadic. So we're using applicatives. So I, I should use the applicative. So we have an applicative value here. So value 10 in the applicative box. And we have a value 20 in the applicative box here. Um, this operator cannot combine values. This operator combines a function in the, in the box with a value in a box and produces another function of value in a box, right? Um, 
So this is a normal function from A to A uh, on numbers, which takes two arguments, right? So if I F map it to the monadic applicative value 10, I'm gonna get a partially applied function, a carry, which is plus 10, right? I, it actually is a left-hand side, so it will be 10 plus, right? Uh, so I have the left-hand side filled up with 10, but the right-hand side is missing. So after this first part, I will still have a function inside an applicative box, and then I will apply it to an applicative value, which is like this function is missing the right-hand side argument, so this will fill in. So I will have just 10 plus 20, and that means I have just 30, right? So to, to prove this, let's go to GCI and let's say I have a plus. What type is plus? Well, it's from number to number. So it's a normal function, no boxes, right? And then if I F map it to just 10, what I'm gonna get? I'm gonna get, uh, so what is the type of this? Well, it is a function from A to A inside the box. So basically doing this um, puts my normal function from A to A into a box. And this function is, remember this function is from A and A to A. This function takes two arguments, but after partially applying it to 10, now it takes one argument and produces a number, right? So the type of plus 10 is from A to A, from A to A, but a type of the plus is from A, A to A. So it has two arguments. So now after doing this, I have a function, single argument function in the box, and I can use this operator to combine it with just 20, right? So if I combine this with this, I get just 30. Those braces are not needed. So I still get no compiler error. And then I can, again, replace this with pure and it will work fine, right? All right, one more. So look at it, do a mental mental analysis of the code. So we have a record type student, which takes a name and age. A name is a string and age is an int. And then we are constructing the, the student by passing the parameters to the record. And we're not using the a student as a function, we're using student with this kind of a record notation by passing the um, the parameters to the student. So we're saying M is this student, and then we're printing M. So, okay, stare at it for five more seconds. And think if this code is correct or not. All right, so then answer. Is this code correct or not? Good. So then people who said this, this code is not correct, say why this code is not correct. Okay, leaderboard is Ronald still leading? No, it has been overtaken by Virum. Congrats. So why, why you said that this code is not correct? Why do it get an error? Hmm. 
All right, so we're looking at the code. We're doing a, a, a mental walkthrough, okay? So this line of code is correct. It declares a student um, with the name and age, string and int. This line of code uh, declares M uh, and binds it to an instance of a student, which has a name and age. So those two lines are correct. And then the final line prints M. And that line is also correct. But why the compiler will complain at this point? So those two lines are correct. Fine. This line is also correct. We just want to convert M into a string and show it on the screen. But this will not happen. Why it will not happen? Because when we declare this type, when we say student, we like what will print M do? What it will try to do? Exactly. So um, Timo is correct. It ba he, he basically points out that uh, this line would like to convert this to string and print it, but we didn't derive a show. So we didn't derive show for our type. So the, the show type class is not defined and the method show will not work for our student. It will if we say derive uh, show, uh, but in this, case, in this particular case, it, we, we forgot about it. So this code will not work. Uh, so this one is a correct answer. Um, Exactly. So we cannot print structs. We have to tell the compiler um, or the runtime system or the type system how to print, how to convert our struct into our record type into the string. And we do that normally by just deriving the implementation. But we can write our own implementation if we want to by hand, but we usually say derive show, right? All right, so let's have a break. Uh, we finish this kind of review and we will talk a little bit about the... Um, that's right. So we need to derive show. And it, it, is the same in, um, it is the same in Rust. So in Rust, we also need to use this deriving and kind of derive the implementations for converting something to, uh, to debug strings or to strings. All right, so let's have a break. Um, let me see. Let's go. Um, timer, 10 minutes. Let's do nine minutes. And I will break the recording for a moment. Zoom recording. All right, so debugging. Debugging is a little bit controversial topic. Um, so let's first do some terminology right. So what is benchmarking? How would you say in a few words what a benchmarking is? Benchmark. Specs. Yes, but not necessarily limits. Yeah, that, that is the good answer. So we, we usually have some form of a test and then we applying that test to multiple things or the same thing with changing some variables and we are measuring the same kind of, um, it could be memory consumption, it could be a speed, it could be the time. Um, and and we, we have some sort of a test, we have some sort of a um, metric which we comparing things with. So for example, I can, 
I don't know, generate a million numbers and uh, multiply them together on my laptop. And then I give you the code and say, do that on your laptop. And we have a benchmark where we can compare two laptops. We can say, okay, my laptop took, took X amount of time and your one took less or more, right? And we can compare things. So we use benchmarking in order to compare things. So, so we measure something once, we measure the same thing second time, and then we comparing two things. We comparing how laptops work or how CPUs work or how a system with that amount of RAM performs versus system with that per amount of RAM, or we have a test for IO and we testing our laptop with SSD and then with, um, you know, um, non-SSD hard drive. And then we basically doing benchmarking for comparison reasons. And there are standard benchmarks for GPUs, for IO, for CPUs. And those are called benchmarks because they say, yep, this CPU, Intel Core i7, performs on this benchmark like this. And then Apple CPU you know, performs like this, right? Exactly. So we we doing it for comparisons. And then I uh, kind of generated a very tiny um, benchmark for our laptops um, because I sometimes um, uh, say, oh, it took six seconds on my laptop and then it, it it is taking 30 seconds on your laptop and you don't know if it is better or more, or, more, or, or worse than, than my one, right? So there is this... Um, you know, dummy benchmark uh, written in, in um, Rust, and you basically, yeah, let's let's go there. Examples for benchmark, and if you say Rust, um, no, you say carg cargo run release, uh, it gives you a metric. Um, so on my laptop, if you do this, um, it uh, takes, yeah, if, if I run it again, it takes about seven seconds, but most of the time it takes 6.3. Uh, currently it's, it's taking longer because I'm recording and using Zoom. If I was not recording and not occupying CPU and not do, doing the lecture, it would probably take about 6.3. Uh, so I can run it again. So my uh, multiplier is about one, right? So um, if your laptop is less than one, it means it's my, faster than my laptop. And if, if it is more, then it means it's slower. So if I say um, my laptop took six seconds to do this and your laptop took 30, but your multiplier is like 10, that means your implementation is much faster than mine, even though it is taking longer time, right? So this is a benchmark. The benchmark is for comparing things. Um, all right. What is profiling? And why we do profiling for? Do we need efficient implementations for benchmarks? No. Actually, not at all. We want some shitty implementations uh, because we're not comparing implementations. Here we're comparing how fast laptops are, right? So if the implementation is really shitty, that's fine um, in terms of using resources or, or whatever, right? But what is profiling? Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, but th this one, uh, this one focuses on time. We can be profiling our uh, system for time, but we can also be profiling it for memory usage, um, or we might be profiling it for cache misses. So, for example, we can. 
measure how many cache misses we have in our program or how many times our data cache or our code cache is invalidated and we need, like the CPU needs to refresh it. Um, so there are different targets for profiling, but if you say how much and then something uh, takes, it helps us to detect bottlenecks or it helps us to optimize, uh, to improve the performance of our, of our implementations. So that is a correct answer. And then the last one is what is debugging? Finding bugs, exactly. Exactly. So those are very good answers. All, all of them are very good. Um, but, but, why you do debugging? Because you have buggy software, but where, where, what else? What else do you use debugging for? And I, I bet the other reason is more frequent. Okay. Exactly. That's what I was looking for. To analyze your behavior of the program, to understand what your program is actually doing, what the variables values are, and so on. You may not even have bugs. Your program may just work fine, but you want to know how it works, like what is happening, right? And we often do debugging for that. We check variables like, okay, what value the variable has now? Uh, what it has in the next loop? Uh, how it goes, how it branches and so on. We use debuggers for this, right? To understand the behavior of the program. Uh, and then to understand unexpected behavior. So that is, we do that a lot, and we do that a lot when we're learning programming and when we're learning languages. Um, so we may have not fully understood what the code is doing, and we use debugger for this. Um, and my point is that we basically using debugging for those three things, and the first one is the most important and probably the only reason why you would really do debugging. Um, the other two we do use debugging for, but most of the time there are better ways to ensure correctness and there are better ways to understand the code than the manual debugging, going into debugger and checking the values and so on. I know I am uh, I'm not necessarily, um, like not all of you will agree with me. Uh, some of you really like um, doing debugging for those two reasons, but objectively speaking, this is very inefficient. You kind of wasting time. Um, so you should not do debugging for those two reasons. You should do debugging for the first reason, of course, but maybe sometimes for the second, but definitely not for the last point. Um, if you're doing debugging for the last point, you sort of uh, wasting your time. Um, all right, so what we should do for understanding the code instead? Um, well, you should just check the code with your eyes, like, you know, look at the source code, <laughs> understand what it is doing right, right there, right? Um, so for those very simple, you know, use cases, um, that we had before, 
So let me go back to some code snippet. Okay, like this one, okay? I mean, if, if, if you don't see that this one doesn't derive the, like, of course the compiler will tell you what the error is and you should immediately know, oh well, yeah, I, I, I didn't derive a show for my type, right? Um, you don't use debugging for things like this. You don't like, you, you know what the code is doing. You see it, right? And it's just the level of how much you can see um, in the code. The more um, the more you read code, the more things become like in your face, like obvious. You don't really need to think about it. Like you see it straight away, right? So the, the whole point is to become so uh, trained such that most of the things uh, you can actually see directly um, uh, with your eyes, right? Just, just like uh, staring at the code. Um, if you start working and you start working in a team, sometimes you will have a function and sometimes the function will have a little bit, un, like you, you will not quite know why it doesn't work the way you intend it to work. And you will call your, your friend, you will call a, your, a buddy say, yeah, just check it, like look at it. And sometimes the, the the second person will look at it and immediately will say, yeah, here, you know, here is your problem. <laughs> Uh, and you and you wouldn't see it, right? Um, so this kind of you wouldn't see it because you have a certain bias of how you see what you have wrote yourself. You have the bias of intention of what it should do, but it kind of um, forbids you to see how it actually works. Uh, and the second person doesn't come with this bias and immediately see your your error, right? And you will do the same for for the other person. Um, because you will kind of uh, just analyze like, okay, this line is doing this, this line, and boom, you know it, right? Um, if you're not sure, you can use GHCI, like uh, I'm, I'm talking here in the context of Haskell. Uh, and of course you should have doc tests and unit tests. So ensuring that the functions do what they are intended to do is best by doing unit tests and by doing doc tests because then you sort of uh, know that at the unit level or at the function level with doc tests, you have fulfilled some you know, requirements and this is automated. So those two points are automated. So then you don't need to do them manually. That point is very fast because you're just doing it with your, with your eyes, with your, with your head. And then this one is kind of like a learning step just to make sure that your interpretation or your understanding is good. And this is much faster than Googling because you can check the type, you can check how things are, are composing and you can use GHCI in your, in your own context, in your, with your own functions. So you can kind of interrogate them and, and kind of check them. So this one is a manual step, but it's um, quite efficient. Um, this one is very efficient and those two are, you know, full automation. So you don't wasting time uh, repeating any of that, right? Uh, if you change your code, your tests will have to pass. So you have the kind of uh, added benefits. So how you en en ensure correctness? The same steps, right? So you do mental work, work walkthroughs, uh, you use doc tests and unit tests. And you may need to use GHCI sometimes when you're learning, especially because some of the things are not automated yet, right? Like I don't need to check how apply or bind work because I, I've used it so many times that it's like automatic. But you may need to check. You may need to go to GHCI and kind of a double check that your intuitions and your understanding is correct, right? Um, but automate, use those things and train yourself with reading code and doing mental walkthrough, right? Especially with the age of chat GPT, where you will need to walk mentally walk through the code it gives you, right? You're not gonna like load it to the debugger and kind of try debugger to understand how it works. You have to be kind of quick. Um, so mental walkthrough is a skill that you need to practice. Um, so, if you can choose automation versus manual labor, always choose automation. Always choose doc tests and unit tests versus manually debugging stuff, right? Um, put assertions, uh, do unit tests, do doc tests. Try to automate your own work. Um, if you're doing something manually, it's like, I, I, I'm just going to test it. 
uh, and you run it, you pass some input data, you just test it. You're putting yourself to repeating that over and over again every time you're doing some changes. If you make it into a test, it will just run automatically in your CI pipeline and then you'll never worry about it. So promote automation. All right, so mental work walkthrough. What is this? Like, what is this give, gives us? Do you need debugger to understand what it is doing? Yeah, it is quite a, you know, dense piece of code. Um, but it should be pretty straightforward, right? So what's the answer? What's the answer of take five a list from that previous list? Yeah, what those five numbers are. From here, a list is this list. So what are the first five numbers of this list? So what, what is this code doing? What is this? What is a list? Well, a list starts with zero and one. We know that for sure, right? So the first two elements are clear, zero and one. They are just right here in your face. What is the next element? Well, the next element is you combine plus with a list, so zero and one, and you shift it by one because we take taking like, so a list is the, the first argument, left argument to our plus, and tail is the right argument, and it's that the tail of a list. So we like the next element will be zero plus one, right? Because we're taking a list and the one after. So zero, one. Zero plus one is one. And then one plus one is two. And then one plus two is three. So the first five elements is zero, one, one, two, three. Right? We can do it in our head. Like we can just stare at the code and do it without using a debugger. We can kind of deconstruct this expression in our heads. And this is basically Fibonacci, right? So it's a co compact way of expressing a Fibonacci list, Fibonacci sequence. 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and hope. list goes on. All right, so declare yourself. Uh, so how often, like here on the left-hand side, you never do debugging in my IDE, and here you do it very often, right? So how much debugging you do with your IDE? How many print statements you use in your code? Do you do external command line debuggers? Uh, do you look into variables in, in the either debuggers? So if you do them, put yourself here. If you sometimes do them, put yourself in the middle. And if you never do this, put yourself to the left. Yeah, so when I was learning programming, I was heavily putting print statements in my code. <laughs> and I was, um, yeah, that the IDs were not that great in my era. So I was sort of using command line debuggers, um, but not as often as print statements. So I was heavy here. Um, as I progressed, I didn't put stuff here. I was doing mental work workthroughs, but for some things I couldn't work out what is going on. So I had to use debugging. So I was probably kind of a command line and debuggers, but not many print statements anymore. 
And now I try to be on the left on all of those things. I try to be here. I almost never use debuggers or um, print statements. Um, but if you do have a bug in your code, you will have to use some form of debugging. Um, that happens. My recommendation is to avoid debugging altogether. Don't do any of this, especially don't do print statements. That's the worst. Um, it pollutes your code, that unnecessary code, and it, it is just um, a very um, useless activity. It takes you time. Uh, of course, it teaches you how your code works, but once you train yourself how the code works, don't do this anymore. Don't put print statements. Um, try to do debugging. Uh, sometimes it is useful, um, but in general, try to avoid it altogether. So avoid manual debugging. What to do instead? Um, we will talk a, a little bit about it. Um, about benchmarking. Do you time your functions? Do you do some form of benchmarking? Uh, do you use some benchmarking tools, like for example, in Golang um, and profiling? Do you know what flame charts and graphs are? Have you ever used them? If you did, put yourself somewhere. And if you didn't, put yourself to the left. Do you time your functions? Like, do you say uh, start and end, and then you say end minus start, and you print how long certain functions take in your code, like using the clock? If you've done it, yeah, put yourself somewhere to the right. Golang and Rust, uh, they, do, they do have a very nice benchmarking frameworks built in, um, and you can use it for both benchmarking and profiling. Um, Haskell, Golang, and Rust all have very nice profiling tools. And you can generate like a flame charts for your code and see where the bottlenecks are, like what is taking long time. And then you can focus on it if you're trying to optimize performance. Uh, we may have a lecture on, on profiling and how to use those tools. Um, so we will learn a little bit more. But it is. Um, it would be nice if, if you are sort of on your on the right hand side here, right? So compared to this one, I want you all to be on the left hand side. Don't be on the right hand side. And on this one, I want you to be more on the right hand side and not so much on the left. So profiling and benchmarking, you should do. You should do more. Um, that teaches you more what and how to code. Um, debugging doesn't teach you uh, good practices. It is not a good thing to do. So try to avoid it. So um, use doc tests and unit tests. Do tests. Test your functions. Takes your sub functions. Test your units. T test your building blocks. Um, doc tests are great. Very cheap. Uh, especially in Haskell. Uh, you don't really have them in Rust, but in Haskell, definitely use them. Uh, use unit tests and assertions in Rust. Um, all right. So for, for ensuring correctness, use tests. Heavy, heavy testing. Uh, especially if something is not correct, then you have to have more tests. Um, for understanding, use GHCI and mental staring at the code to train yourself with the reading skills and kind of a mental debugging, like mental going through what the code is doing. Uh, like that's what we did here, right? Um, so we, we mentally walk through this code uh, to understand that it starts with zero, one, and then zip with zip zips two lists together by the operation, and we end up with another list. And the operation here is just plus. Um, so walking like mentally through the code, um, it it is like a skill. Like the more you do it, the the, the easier it will become for you, and the, the faster you will be at it. 
Okay. Um, so what if you have incorrect program? If it doesn't do what, what you intended to do? Well, then write more tests, like uh, try to, uh, based on the errors, if you have errors, uh, try to find out where it might be and put more tests into your functions such that you know that all the functions are kind of tested. Put the the tests for the values that are throwing an error or, or, or not working. Sometimes, you know, you tested your function with some values and the test pass, but for the value that you didn't test, it, it, it blows up, right? So put that test into your tests. Um, all right, uh, Haskell is really unique because it, it is extremely difficult to debug. Um, yeah, you, you don't have to write, I will tell you why. Because it's lazy and because it's declarative. Um, imperative programs, they have a very nice step-like behavior. So they go kind of a step-by-step step, and that's what you can um, use print statements or you can use debuggers. But with Haskell, with the lazy evaluations and very declarative, concise notation, it's kind of really difficult. And also a lot of your business logic is in a pure, pure functions. It's purely functional. So you cannot actually inject print line statements inside your code. Um, so for those reasons, de debugging Haskell is kind of a really pain. Um, the good thing is you almost never need to debug it because most of the time, if you write your Haskell and it compiles, most of the time it will actually work uh, the way you intend it. Um, not always, but most of the time. Um, like, you know, comparing, let's say, to JavaScript, <laughs> JavaScript will always run, but the behavior is almost always not what you want. In <laughs> uh, here, it's the other way around. It's really hard to get it to actually run because the compiler, same in Rust, Rust is also quite picky. Um, the compiler will complain a lot. And if you decompose your program, it will almost always be correct. Uh, but, you know, you can still have problems, but, you know, you, 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 you really want to debug Haskell. So my first advice is to avoid debugging. But if you really need to do it, if you really need to, to do debugging, um, then you can. Um, there is a little trick you can you can use. Um, I have bugs. I had problems with some of the implementations in, in Haskell that didn't do what they supposed to do. And of course, the pro problem is almost always uh, kind of like a mental um, inability to, to see of what is wrong. Um, especially in, in Haskell because of this concise notation and you're doing quite complex things in a very dense, dense way. So I had to debug my, my code, like decompose it more and debug it once in the last, um, in the last I don't know, four years. Um, all the other problems I solved by putting more tests and then identifying which function was at fault, like which function didn't pass the tests that were causing the, the bug, and then staring at the function and kind of understanding why was the way I solved all the uh, bugs that I had. So at one point I had to actually walk through myself, uh, but that that is quite unique. So I do recommend um, tests and staring at the code more uh, but if you really, really, really want to debug, then there is this trace thing. So in Haskell, you can do import uh, debug trace and the trace function is quite uh, neat. So it is like a cheat, um, it's a cheat function. So it takes a string and then it takes a function from A to A, any function from A to A. And basically it prints that string before it executes that that function from A to A, right? So let me um, quickly demonstrate it. So, okay, so how much time do we have? Yeah, we don't have much time. So I have written, um, there are two small projects uh, in lectures. 
So in lectures, after this lecture, there is a reverse Polish notation calculator, which is using uh, monads to do a very simple um, reverse Polish notation calcula calculator. And there is this uh, calculator basics. So I will go to, this, to the basic one and I will show you what it does. So reverse Polish notation is, um, Clear that. Uh, reverse Polish notation is a notation where instead of using infix or, or postfix notation, um, we use um, kind of the uh, opera operators for the operation come before. So we sort of like a prefix. So if I say plus 10, uh, 20, that would be postfix. So I have plus the operation, and then I have the arguments, right? If I do infix, I would say 10 plus 20. But if you do this, you have kind of like a reverse Polish notation where all the arguments to your operations come first and then come your operations. So for example, let's let's do let's do uh, one plus two, and then we multiply the result by by 10. And to do this, I would have to put those things in brackets because the precedence means that two times 10 would go first and then, but we want we want to get 30, right? Not 21, we want to get 30. So I would have to put those into brackets. But if I do this, if I put two, one, two, and 10, and then do pl um, plus first, uh, and then do the multiplication. If you imagine that um, those values are sort of like on the stack. Um, so let, let's do a right hand side to be the top of the stack and then the left hand side to be the, the bottom of the stack. I would have 10 on the bottom of the stack. I would have two as the second top argument and one as the top argument. And then I would do plus I would do plus and multiply. Then what will happen is plus will fetch the first two arguments from the stack, which is one and two, add them together and put the result back on the top of the stack. So then on the top of the stack, I would have three and 10. And then multiply will fetch again two arguments from the stack and give me 30 because it would multiply three by 10, right? So if I run it, I get 30. So that's what the, the basic Polish uh, reverse calculator does, and it has two operations built in, like I, I currently only implemented two, plus and multiplication, and it basically does what we expect, right? So if I go, if I go there, I can show you the, um, it, it takes line by line, and then maps process line onto the line, and then it sort of uh, unlines the results and puts it into the into the loop such that I can uh, interactively pass lines into the code. And then this is the implementation. And the implementation takes, um, it, it runs process line, and it takes string and returns string. So now if I were to debug it, um, I would go into main, I would say import debug trace, trace. And remember trace takes a string and then apply the function, which is from something to something. So in our case, um, we would say trace uh, processing line. And then it takes this. Um, so now map, normally map was um, was taking a single function process line, and then we had um, injected. Yeah, so now if I do 20, 10, multiply, 
I will get this extra output when this, this function is being called. So the process line is being called and because I kind of decorated it with this, I am calling it with, with this, right? So you can see that trace can be kind of injected into your into your various parts of your processing. And then you can print yourself whatever you want. You can also, if we have, um, so let's do a different thing. So let's say main equals, uh, yeah, so let's do this. at two, and then we will read input. So then, um, right, and then I'm, I'm just gonna do a very quick at two okay and we made a mistake and we wrote 10 okay so then um yes so i need to do this uh, so let's let's run it. So I'm putting uh, thirty, and we it should be thirty two. Oh. Uh, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, get content. So I need to finish the. I need to finish the input so then it gives me 40 so it's it's wrong right that we have a bug the outcome should be 32 and we have 40 so then what i can do is i can annotate at two um and instead i can also annotate it here so i can say state adding two input x and then i'm doing the the actual thing that I'm doing. So I will. Plus. So I have the string and then I have the A to A, right? Uh, so I'm actually doing this trace inside here and this will work. Um, and now if we do it again and do 30, uh, and then finish the, the pipe, it says I'm adding two and input is 30 and then, you know, the result is 40. So I can kind of annotate and get what, what I want, right? I can do a little bit of a print line debugging, uh, in Haskell using this trace facility, right? Um, all right, I will come back uh, later on next week into those two calculators, uh, but you can study the implementations and you can kind of uh, try to understand um, reverse Polish notation and how we currently solving it with the very simple, um, very simple um, implementation using faults. And then the other implementation is using a monad. So you can uh, have a look uh, into the implementation, which is called RPN calc. And that one is also implementing only two operations, plus and multiplication. But instead of using a fault, it uses, it uses kind of a monadic uh, construct, which is much more um, nice to work with and much more flexible. So I will come back to this um, next week. All right, thank you very much. And the lab will be with the TAs in 255 at a normal normal um, quarter past two today. Sorry for going a little bit over time.